Well, uh, today I'm going to uh, kind of continue with um, what I talked about last week. Last week we talked about our hurts and God as the healer. And this week I want to just continue that with some more thoughts. Um, right now I'm working on a project related to this and it's just what's on my mind. And so I just want to, I feel like there's a little bit more that I want to share with you today. And so, um, you know, we start off with some of the things that we said last week. You know, first of all, uh, our troubles are not unusual. Uh, we're not weird, you know, but when we, when we find ourselves in a lot of pain and a lot of trouble, we, we start to think that we're unusual. And certainly the world would tell us that we're unusual. They won't tell us that straight up, but they'll tell us that uh, through, you know, this commercial or that commercial, this message or that message. We start intuiting that we're supposed to have our feeler, you know, uh, stuck on a real consistent feeling most of the time. And then if our feeler gets out of whack, well, then something's wrong with us. We're abnormal. We're unusual. Um, and so, you know, also if you're, if you're not able to cope, I mean, you just don't have the right coping mechanisms and you need to learn better coping mechanisms. And so because, you know, most people... Uh, they're striving to be successful and good at what they do and be achievers and be strong, be strong. And you know what's funny about the business that we're in as believers is that we're never told to be strong. We're actually told to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And as we'll see today, he says his strength is made perfect in our weakness. So what I want you to see, if you don't see it yet, what I want you to see is that we've got a message from the world this says, be strong, be successful, make yourself feel good about yourself. And if you don't feel good about yourself, there's something wrong with you because your feelings shouldn't be like that. And if you can't deal with your troubles, there's something wrong with you because you should be stronger than that. You're weird and you're unusual. That's the message of the world. Now... There's a reason that the scripture tells us to uh, not be anxious, but cast our anxieties on the Lord. Why would it say that? Well, because God knows we're going to be anxious. I mean, he knows that these feelings are going to come up. Uh, the Bible addresses fear. The Bible addresses worry. The Bible addresses anxiety. Uh, the Bible addresses trouble. And wh what we need to see is we don't go to the Bible for an hour a week for some spiritual sounding stuff and then go over here and then learn to try to cope like the world. The same Bible that carries us to heaven through the message of Jesus Christ and salvation in him is the same Bible through which God speaks to us about trouble, about our emotions, about our feelings. Our troubles are not unusual. But of course, there's a myth out there, and maybe you've even heard it with a little bit of Christianese put on it, a little bit of... Uh, uh, Christian lingo thrown in for good measure. And that is, I will never experience more than I can bear. Now, a real spiritual way to put that myth is God will never allow you. God will never allow you to experience more than you can bear. Well, I want to tell you that's wrong. It's not the truth. Let's look at God's word together. Second Corinthians, Paul writes, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, I more, more so in, in far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times, countless times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A, day and, a night and a day I have spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, danger, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger, what happened to the prosperity gospel, and thirst, <laughs> often, often without food, in cold and exposure. Trouble. Wow. Wow. Does this encapsulate some of the things that you've struggled with? A broken home, a broken heart, loss, grief, depression, circumstances that won't change for who knows how long. Trouble is not unusual. 
you're not weird. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. Here it is. We were under great pressure. Look at this now. Read it slow. Far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. Okay? So now put this up against that old theory of God will never allow you to experience more than you can bear. That's error. It's not true. We most certainly will experience more than we can possibly bear. Welcome to planet Earth. And it's normal. Paul goes on, he says, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. So let me ask you a question. You know, we like to ask, I certainly like to ask, why is this happening to me? Don't we like to ask that? Why is this happening? Well, here's a better question. How in the world am I going to learn dependency on the Lord Jesus Christ if everything that happens to me I can already bear within myself? How in, the, how in the world am I going to learn trust and to, to, to lean back into the arms of my, my father and look to him, look to the creator, not the creation? How am I going to learn this unless the circumstances necessitate that? Unless the circumstances drive me to that? Jesus put it this way, in this world you will have trouble. That about sums it up. We can all go home now. So you're not weird, you're not abnormal, you're not unusual. If you're struggling, it's planet Earth. But we want to ask why this happened to us, and of course, you know, we want to throw in that Christian karma thing. We want to connect the dots. Maybe this is happening to me because I did this, and so God is now getting me back for what I did. And so we try to stitch together these things and connect the dots and we'll have a logical progression of ideas. I did X, therefore God is doing Y. The whole message of the cross is that the cross destroys any notion of Christian karma. God is not punishing us for our sins. He punished Jesus. The punishment was death. Jesus paid it all and there's no punishment left. That all sounds great for church, but then on Monday morning, I struggle, I have circumstances, and I start thinking, is God trying to get me here? Is, is God trying to pay me back for what I... And then the cross, the whole notion of it, just goes out the window. God is wanting to assure us through this new covenant. He's wanting to assure you, I'm not out to get you. I'm not out to punish you. The punishment, the wages for one sin alone is death. And Jesus died. He took it all. And now you don't owe me. But we want to connect the dots. There is no Christian karma. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So this means that uh, I'm going to have to be acquainted with something that doesn't feel so good. It's not real popular. Uh, it certainly doesn't jive with the philosophies of the world that I would be acquainted with my weakness and then get this, that it would be okay for me to not know how to cope. That it would be okay for me to admit that I, I can't cope. That it would be okay for me to admit I'm feeling all these things that the world says is negative or unusual. or we I'm feeling all these things and I can't change it. I don't have any power to change it. So what about, what about just admitting that for starters? His power is made perfect in my weakness. What does weakness look like? Our feelings are not unusual. We see... Uh, Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Earlier I said the Christian life is not about us uh, getting stronger or being strong or even trying to be strong. You notice here Paul says the power is of, of a God and it's not of ourselves. So I come to a place where I'm saying, you know what, uh, it's not going to be me. <laughs> I can tell you that. It's not going to be me. It's got to be something other than me. It's got to be someone other than me. And, and then 
then we might be in the place of saying he, if we know his goodness, and we really think he's in, not just up, but in, if he's in, then I can start believing he will do it all for me. He will do it all in me. He will, all, he will do it all through me. He will do it all for me. And my job is to let, as I've said before, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let my speech be seasoned with him. Let, let my light shine before men. Who is our light? Him, not me, him. And so it's his power. What about those feelings, though? You know, those feelings that, you know, they're trying to prescribe away, those feelings that they're trying to band-aid away, those feelings that we're trying to shove down because they're embarrassing. You know, if people knew, you know, I'm feeling all this antisocial stuff. <laughs> I'm not supposed to feel the antisocial stuff. Really? So you're, you were born... And, and you're, you were born perfectly programmed in your mind and emotions, and you're just supposed to cruise, and anything that is a fluctuation, that's just weird. Welcome to planet Earth, the emotional roller coaster of planet Earth. Afflicted. What does affliction feel like? Perplexed. You know what perplexed means? I have no clue what's going on. <laughs> This is the Apostle Paul. I have no clue what's going on. I'm confused. I'm perplexed. I'm like, God, what? Come on, man. I'm your number one guy. I'm the only one going to the Gentiles. What is going on? You know, I'm kind of in a hurry here. If you could speed things up, we could be more effective. <laughs> Struck down, but not destroyed. Do you see this? Life hits us, but the counselor is in. The hurt hits us, but the healer is within. Feelings are brainless responders. That sounds awful, doesn't it? Who wants to be a brainless responder? But it's true. Our emotions, they have no intellect at all. So that's why I'm saying don't be shocked at what you feel but just recognize that what you feel is driven by what you think. What you feel did not come out of a magic box. What you feel did not come out of a vacuum or a black hole. What you feel came from thoughts. And a lot of those everyday thoughts that we have come from a belief system. You see, belief systems drive thoughts and thoughts drive emotions. So I want to get my emotions fixed, and I'm trying to fix my emotions. Does that make any sense? No. It's my thoughts that need to be fixed. But how am I going to fix my thoughts? By going back to my belief systems that drive my thoughts. What am I talking about there? Well, if you've got a belief system in Christian karma that God's out to get you, He's going to pay you back for your sins, well, then something happens in life, a circumstance, and your thought is, this is God punishing me. So then your feeling is you feel punished, you feel condemned, you feel distant, you feel dirty, you wonder where God is. How could he be doing this to me? Why is he? Of course he's doing this to me. Look what I... And see, the feelings and the thoughts are driven by the false belief system. Don't go through life trying to put a band-aid on your emotions. Let your emotions be there. The Bible doesn't say don't be angry. It says be angry. But don't choose to sin in your anger. God's not saying shove your anger in the closet. He's saying talk to me about it. Let me, let me work through it with you. You know what anger, the root of anger is? The root of anger is hurt. You know, um, you're, uh, you're walking down the hallway of your house. And somebody, you know, you know, they always do this to you. They pop out and scare you. <laughs> right? What's your... What's your first thought? Your first feeling? Fear for just a second, and then it's <sighs> anger. Right? I can't believe you did that to me. That hurt me. I, you made me scared. You embarrassed me. You made me scared, so now I'm going to get angry. But what's at the root of the anger? It's the fear or the hurt. It's the same with any anger. We don't just get angry because an angry feeling hit us. 
We get angry because we've been hurt. And so what's the healer wanting to do? He's not saying don't be angry, don't be angry. He's saying be angry. But cast all your anger, cast all your anxiety, cast all your fear, cast all your hurt on me and talk to me about it. Well, what's he going to say about it? It's all great to say, give it to God, give it to God, give it to God. What does God say about it and how does he heal me? Well, let's keep talking about this. So we need a renewing of the mind, not the emotions. The scripture says, and don't be conformed to this world. What does that mean? Remember the world's telling us something? What's the world telling us? You're weird. You're unusual. You shouldn't hurt. You shouldn't feel these things. And we need to fix your feelings. The Bible's saying, don't be conformed to that philosophy. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So fill your head with stuff that is good from God. Fill your head with stuff that is acceptable and, and actually is perfect belief system. You know, God's new covenant is a perfect belief system. The message of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is a perfect belief system. It is perfectly acceptable to God who is the creator, and he has designed us as the creation to fill our heads with thoughts that are good and acceptable and perfect. And then as we fill our heads with these thoughts, the emotions may follow, and I say may. They may follow in a day, a week, a month, a year, or a decade. They may follow. Healing happens. But get this now. I don't fill my head with that stuff just to feel better. I fill my head with that stuff because it's true. And then I let the chips fall where they may. But God tells me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, not my emotions. But renewed to what? Sounds good. I want new mindsets, new attitudes. But renewed to what? It just sounds nebulous to me. Let go, let God. What, it, what does God do with it all? Renewed to what? Perfect love. Earlier we saw it's good, acceptable, and perfect stuff that God wants to fill our heads with. It's his perfect love. You see here, my problem is fear in this passage. My problem is fear, and it's perfect love that casts out fear. You ever been around somebody you're fearful of? They judge you, they measure you against a standard, and you're kind of tiptoeing and walking on eggshells, and you feel like getting out of that room as quick as you can. You don't seek them out. You're not looking for a relationship. You get tense. And then you're around somebody else, and you know that since you were this high, they loved you, accepted you, embraced who you are. They love you with perfect love, or at least seemingly perfect, near perfect love in your eyes. What does that do to you? <sighs> Relaxes you, right? It makes you want to be close, to draw near, to hang out. You don't want to leave. You wish you didn't have to leave. You see, this is, this is our God. And he says, I'll never leave. What we need to see is that God spells love, C-O-V-E-N-A-N-T. Now, this is not a normal way for us to spell love. But this is, the Romans tells us that God demonstrated his love in this, that Christ died for us. Christ dying for us is the beginning of the new covenant. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood. God spells love with blood. And he spells it as covenant. Covenant is a promise, an agreement, a pact. And when we're used to those things, we're used to signing the deal at the car dealership, you know, and we have to pay our money and then they give us their car. It's a two-part deal. We do our part. They do theirs. But in this covenant, remember that it's the healer and the healer. It's a covenant between God and God because he could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself. And it says in the book of Hebrews that by two, count them there, two, 
two unchangeable things, we have this hope as an anchor. So we have a hope as an anchor for the soul. You know, when the ship starts doing this, we say we need an anchor. What's my anchor? It's this, God's love spelled as covenant between the healer and the healer. And he's saying, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I know what you feel. I felt it. I know what you feel. My disciples felt it. I know what you feel. My apostles felt it. I know what you feel. The early church felt it. I know what you feel. People throughout all the ages have felt it ever since the fall of man. I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised. Now let's talk about what you're thinking. I embrace what you're feeling. I empathize with it. I understand it. I get it. And it's okay to feel that. But now let's talk about what you're thinking. A lot of, these, a lot of this stinking thinking, <laughs> it has to do with the view of ourselves. And it's like we've got a Sunday school identity of, oh, yeah, I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm new in Christ, new in Christ, new in Christ, in Christ. And then over here on Monday or Tuesday or Thursday, we're feeling like I'm no good to God. I'm worthless. I'm just a no good. I'm just a dirty, rotten. So I'm just a, and it goes on and on. What we need to see is this word, this biblical word, you know, the Bible word righteousness. What it's saying, it, righteousness means it, it, it's how much we're worth to God. It's, it's, it's how right we are and what our value is, what our significance is, what our worth is. And I've shared this analogy before, but it's like those old-timey scales. You know, the ones with the bars, and they tilt, and there's a chain, and there's two trays, right? And they kind of go like this. It's Jesus on one side. It's you on the other. And what he's trying to tell us is you are worth Jesus, you are the righteousness of God. I value you. I treasure you. I live in you. I, I cleaned house, and then I took up residence, and I'm never going to leave. And it's because I like you. I like you. I know that we're not allowed to say that in church, but God likes you. <laughs> God likes you. He, he likes your personality. He likes your sense of humor. He likes what you're interested in. You know, um, we, we categorize things. There's like the spiritual church things. Then there's the neutral things. Then there's the sinful things. The, the neutral things. It's funny that we do that. There is no neutral thing. We were talking in our married before kids group. And um, the question came up, you know, how can we involve God in something as mundane as a, a, you know, a, a camping trip? And so there were some good answers. I mean, well, first of all, God's the creator. And so on your camping trip, your trip you're going to see the grass and the trees and the sky, and you're going to see nature and all kinds of things in the woods that are indicative of his creativity. And so you can enjoy that. Um, then somebody else said another good answer. Well, you could... Uh, have a fire and just crack open the Bible and have some devotional time, some teaching, some songs. Good answer, too. There's a deeper answer. Christ is in you the whole time. Whether there's music or no music. Whether there's teaching or no teaching. Whether you can see God's creation or you're blind and we're born that way. The point is, there are no neutral acts. Everything is spiritual. And if Christ lives in us, and we really believe this, what we're saying is, we have reason to not be lonely. He's always with us, no matter what we're doing. He's always in us, no matter what we're doing. And we can look to the Creator, not the creation. They're going to fail us. As I said last week, they're made of glass. They come shattering down at some point. There is only one rock. There is only one solid foundation. Look to the creator, not the creation. Don't get drunk with wine. That's one way to 
relax, isn't it? And that's why people go after it to the point of drunkenness. They're looking to relax. Don't be drunk with wine, that is dissipation, but be filled with God's Spirit. What does being filled with the Spirit mean? Well, filled with His love, His perfect love for us. So here we are, we're Christians and we're in process. You might as well hang a chain around my neck with a big sign right here that says under construction, right? Don't you feel that way? It's the truth, the renewing of the mind. We're growing. But what are we growing into? I like to know what the goal is, right? I mean, there's a battle going on. Imagine after 9-11, you know, up in New York, the 9-11 tragedy. Imagine if uh, George W. Bush got on public television and said, we're, we're obviously in a conflict, and uh, I, I, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> I mean, what would that do to the nation? We would not be inspired. We would go into despair, fear. we got to have a game plan. There's got to be some sort of uh, template or game plan, strategy, focus. I mean, it's great that I'm under construction. It's fine that I'm growing. But what am I growing into? What's it going to look like? What's the plan? The Bible's trying to tell us something. Total acceptance, total forgiveness, a new identity. We are growing into a knowledge of God's goodness toward us. It's really up to us in the sense that, you know, God's feeding us the thoughts. And he's just saying, let these thoughts be in you. I'm feeding you the loving thoughts. I'm feeding you the truthful thoughts. I'm feeding you the comforting thoughts. I'm feeding you the counseling thoughts. You know deep down what the truth is because I implanted the truth there in your heart. But you just have to let. So how good, how good are you going to believe I am? Are you going to blame me for stuff that is the enemy, the world, the flesh, the devil? Or are you going to see that I am the comforter and counselor in you in the midst of that? How good are you going to allow me to be in your mind? How present are you going to allow me to be in your life? I am present. I am no matter what. But are you going to recognize my presence in you or act as if I'm far off? You know, over there up in heaven where you've been firing the prayers. He is in. He is now. Look to the creator, not the creation. Look to Jesus and how he spells love for us. Let's pray together. You may want to just talk to God right now along with me and say, I, I feel all kinds of stuff, Father. I feel rejected. I feel fearful. I feel worry. I feel things that I can't even express. I just I can't explain my emotions. I get perplexed, confused. Father, thank you for accepting this conversation. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you about it. Father, I just pray right now that you would show me the thoughts that are driving all of this. I'm open to your counsel. I'm open to your comfort. Show me the pain, the thoughts, the driving force behind all of this. And then show me the newness, the new way to think what to set my mind on. Show me your goodness. Teach me to look to your word. Teach me to rely on your spirit. Father, we all, as the church, we thank you. You've done so much more than save us and carry us to heaven one day. You are also the only true healer of our hearts. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
a man who went across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Did you see this? It was on television. About 25 million people watched from the Canadian side. About one, one, no, 25,000 and about 1,000 from the American side. As the crowd looked on, this man, he, he uh, walked across this tightrope and he had this bar in his hand. And, uh, but if you looked closer, if you looked real close, you noticed something unusual. He had a, a safety harness on, and then he had a small, thin cable that was attached to the tightrope behind him, you know, just in case. And so we might be tempted to fasten a little safety cable to our tightrope and, you know, have a backup plan. Well, what if, what if God doesn't come through or... You know, maybe I should cope and deal and be strong. Maybe I should have a backup plan. And what God is trying to tell us is cut through the safety cable and just walk, walk that tightrope with Jesus Christ. And He is enough. He is enough as, as our, our Savior. He is enough as our Lord. But He is enough as our source, our resource, our healer, our life. Isn't that what the Bible says He is? That Christ is our life? So what if I started waking up every day and acting like Christ was my life and that these people out here, they're not life to me, that he is life and that he is a powerful life and that he is enough. Have a great day.